everyone. Good to see everybody that made it out this morning. Good service thus far. Looking forward to the remainder of it. Going to go ahead and look at our bulletin this morning and see what's going to be going on this week. We have three birthdays this week. Miss Alma Mills' birthdays on Monday. And we're partying at the Stonakers this week. We've got Jordan Stonaker on Tuesday and Jerry Stonaker on Saturday. Remember those? Adult choir practice tonight, 4.45 p.m. sharp. So be sure to come on out to that so we can get our songs down. Next Sunday will be our Brian Safe House offering. Please pray for these men and women that will come to God and that they will come to God and live for Him. We also ask you to please pray for our jam program, which is getting uh, started. Um, we had a great turnout last week and expect even more this week. Please pray for these kids and their families and for our leaders who teach them. It's good to have that program going back again. And how about a chuckle? What kind of man was Boaz before he married? Answer, he was ruthless. <laughs> What do you call a pastor in Germany? Answer, German shepherds. <laughs> what excuse did Adam give to his children as why he no longer lived in the Garden of Eden? Your mother ate us out of house and home. <laughs> I like it. We got any other announcements this morning? Nope. Nope. Do we have any testimonies or specials this morning?
So I appreciate this church, appreciate everything you did for me and for my family. And all of us are home safe except Kimberly. And she went back yesterday to Ohio with her Aunt Cassie. And she'll be leaving out of Cleveland this evening at 5 o'clock. So pray she gets home safe. Okay. <coughs> Any others this morning? I'd like to thank the church for all their phone calls, their cards, and especially their prayer. Appreciate every one of them. They do mean so much. Amen, Carl. I'd like to stand for the Lord. Thank you for the great love of the Lord Jesus. God bless you. Amen, Jerry. That is true. him for walking with me each and every day you know uh, we all go through trials and tribulations but there's always one good thing to know that he's there to guide us and direct us the dark hills, the highways, the byways. He walks on the pillows of life's troubled sea. He walks through the to guide you and me. God walks the dark hills to guide my footsteps. He walks everywhere by night and by day. Show me the way. 
Okay, who's next? Youth choir.
Testimonies or specials? Yep, we'll go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. And need to ask you to remember Brother Warren. He's not doing good right now. His face, part of his face drooped while he's back here um, at the door. And so they're taking him to the doctor to see what's going on. So um, be much in prayer for him. Not sure exactly what caused it or whatever, but just be much in prayer. All right. Other spoken requests starting my right. Our children, please. Unspoken about that raised hand. 
Lots of them out there. At this time, I'd like to ask Brother Daniel if he would lead us in prayer. Brother Daniel. Different, different thing. Anniversaries. Yeah. Then we'll go with birthdays. If you've had a birthday in the last week, like to come forward and celebrate with us, you're more than welcome. If not, everybody, um, stand up and sing number three hundred and sixty-nine, three six nine. Chapter number five, First Peter chapter number five. Okay. All right. How are we doing today? Everybody good? Everybody happy? Michelle, are you happy? Sure. Daniel, are you happy? Yeah. Are you happy, Daniel? If she's happy, I'm happy. <laughs> she's happy. For the kid, are you smiling? You happy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Miss Lynn, are you happy? Sure, sure. Miss Judy? You're blessed. Amen. Amen. How about you, Steve? You happy? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I hate that about Warren. I didn't. I didn't see. Uh, he is. He is. Well, Warren is. He's really uh, growing in the Lord. Had some good conversations with him. He's a good man. Warren's a good man. 
Okay, we're in 1 Peter chapter 5. Are you there? Okay, I want you to look uh, verse 1 verse, and we're going to jump off from here. I'm going to talk about a subject that's uh, pretty common, but uh, just help us to further identify. 1 Peter 5 will be here in not many days on a Sunday morning. Uh, verse number 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the, that, that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So let's have prayer and we'll get into it. Father, we love you. We thank you for your words. And we pray you'll bless our time of study. Please watch over the Sunday school classes. Pray for the teachers to have uh, the endowment of your power and wisdom as they teach. And may, Lord, the young people's hearts be captivated for you. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, in our present age, there's, there's no lack of interest about the subject of Satan. Um, and it, honestly, it's offensive to me. Um, when I was a child, um, I remember as a child anyway that it was just far more, um, you know, it just wasn't as common to see or hear things about Satan. And, and if you did, it was a cartoon character or something of that sort. I, I remember when the Kiss band, uh, I don't know when they came out, but I remember as a child when I first was exposed to them and uh, scared me to death. I mean, I saw those people dressed the way they were dressed and so forth. And, and, I, and I, I knew nothing about anything of God or anything, but when I saw the Kiss band and I saw all of them and they're performing and so forth, in my own heart as a five-year-old, a six-year-old, I equated whatever they were to evil, you know, uh, to, you know, to who Satan was and so forth. If you like Kiss, get right with God and start listening to music that's God-honoring. I didn't mince my words on that either, okay? I know they may be good people, I don't know, but that they're certainly not promoting the cause of Christ, amen? And so, uh, um, anyway, uh, going back to what I was saying, but it seems more and more now people are identifying with it. I, I saw a picture here <coughs> recently of a guy who actually had went through surgery and he had two horns put on his head. And, uh, and because he, you know, he wanted to identify. I want to be bad like the devil. He wanted to identify with all of that. Um, and then, you know, the rock and roll industry has forever talked about their relationship with the dark side, with Satan and so forth, selling their soul to the devil and seances and, not seances, but sacrifices and all that they've been involved with. And, and so that, that world is, has always been it's there and has always been there, but it's been more secretive and private. But what we find is that it's, it's far more in our face today. And um, just the whole culture of black, and uh, I'm talking about the whole idea of black everything, you know. Just to, and if a person likes black, don't be offended at that, okay? Uh, please, uh, just understand what the context of the message is. Uh, they call it, I believe, um, gothic, gothic wear, gothic dress. And the idea is they want to identify, even in her dress, with, with, with death. And, uh, of course, the skeletons and all of that, you know. I mean, I, I, I don't have any, I have no endearment. There's no sentimental, sentimentality with me with a skeleton. I, there's none. I don't want to put it on anything I have. A skeleton head, you know, anything like that. Now, if you have it, that's between you and the Lord. I'm not judging you. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that in our culture, that it has, it has little by little by little, it's becoming something that is mainstream and accepted. Going back to when I was a child, it was bright colors and happy, and my father knows best, and my three sons, and and people were careful about what they said around the children and what they did, and so forth and so on. Now it isn't that way at all. Kids call their, you know, five-year-old kids call their parents by their first name, and uh, they watch the most horrid things on TV and listen to the most terrible of music and uh, so forth. And so I think it's all right for my kids to listen to rock and roll. Okay, well, 
what I encourage you to do then is before you let, because you're a responsible parent. You're a responsible parent. Can I get an amen on that? Okay, so before you do it, I encourage you to listen to it yourself, get a copy of the lyrics, and read over it yourself. Be a responsible parent first before you let them. Is that reasonable? You, you mean, you're talking about pornographic. This, this, this um, uh, much of this rap music is pure pornographic. Right. I mean, I've, I have in studies, some of my studies, I've read over some of the uh, rap music, thought I would use my message. It, it is ungodly. I mean, just wickedness. And words produce images in our mind. And after reading, I had to, I had to repent. I had to get my own heart. I had to cleanse myself, you know, get cleansing because it was so filthy. Our kids are listening to that. You know, I grew up listening to rock and roll music, not even knowing what I was listening to. Uh, singing, My Angel is a Centerfold, not even knowing what it was. And so, uh, I don't know, what am I talking about? I don't mean to get into rock and roll music, but it's filthy. It's just filthy garbage music. You know, it's filthy garbage. And you don't, if you like it, I don't know what to tell you. Just, that's my opinion of it. I don't, can't say the Bible's opinion of that, but the Bible's opinion of immoral, devil-worshipping, hatred, murderous, and all of that, the Bible, the Bible uh, opinion of that is that it's wicked and straight out of the pits of hell. Now, the Bible doesn't say rock music is, but that seemingly is all they can sing about. And so that's my opinion about it. All right, you got it. You know what my opinion is. Uh, so anyway, but it's become so commonplace uh, that this idea of Satanism, uh, we are finding even in the prison when I was preaching down in Pocahontas, they, they had a Satan, uh, they had a Satan fellowship there. Um, and uh, it actually was canceled out because they had too few members. And at one point they had about seven guys that were coming to it. And the chaplain was praying because according to God, Guidelines, they had to, if they fell under four members, then they would cancel it. And they did. They fell under four members, guys transferred out and they canceled it. But just what do you what do you talk about whenever you get together and you're a Satan it's Bible Satan worshiping study? And uh, anyway, but it's common. The dress, the identity with death, uh, the whore, everything, you know, all the horror stuff. And I, as a young person, prior to getting say, I love horror movies. I enjoyed that adrenaline rush. I loved it. After I got saved, I watched them again. And something inside of me just resisted it. Death and people being killed and all that spiritism and so forth. You know that we shouldn't allow ourselves to be conditioned to accepting that as anything other than what it is. It's our adversary. It's our enemy, and that's what's happened. Is is that even in the church, they. Um, a friend of mine, he was down in, I won't tell you where he's at, but I won't tell you anything because I don't want anybody to try to piece it together if they watch it online. But a friend of mine was in a church and uh, he was listening, vacationing, and he was participating in church. And in the church service, and it was a church like ours, obviously they didn't practice things as ours, but they have a belief, you know, they were independent Baptist church. And they had a guy for special get up and sing, uh, I think it was Highway to Hell, is what he's saying. Now, in the lyrics, everything. And so, where have we come from? You know, what we're talking, I mentioned it in a message about, about how that, there's, if you have a different God and a different master, He's going to lead you on a different path. Is that reasonable? And we live in this world, and we know that the God of this world is Satan, our adversary, and we know that He is not going to lead people on the same path that you and I are going to go. Is that reasonable? Can we accept that? And yet, this, it's been embraced, this, this theology that we need to remove move differences between us and them. I mean, as a 14-year-old reading, reading an article by Amy Grant who talked about the, the birthing of contemporary music, Christian contemporary music, she said in that, she said there's a great, vast, you know, chasm that should be spread between Christian music and between pop music and rock music. And she is considered the mother of contemporary music. And so that's what she endeavored, that's what she was involved with, endeavored to do, was to try to remove 
remove the differences. I don't want to remove differences. I'm not trying to create differences. I don't even care about the differences not even I live for. I'm following my Lord. And so, but we more and more and more have found ourselves lulled to sleep about our adversary to where he's not. As a child, when I saw Kiss, it scared me. I was frightened. And what little bit I had understanding about evil, I associated all of that. And I'm not saying that those men are Satan worshipers. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying they're even bad. But they obviously did not want me to think that they were that they were goody tissues and they were Billy Bibles. Can I get amen on that? I mean, they want to dress in an effeminate way, wear clothes that identify as a woman. And they, you know, grew their hair and their makeup and all of that, which obviously pictures evil. And then they carry on the stage and so forth. And I watched that and it scared me. Not that they said anything about the devil. I didn't even hear that. But everything that I knew about evil and bad and Satan or whatever my little five, six, seven year old mind that I had in my mind, that in turn was a demonstration of all of that evil. I wanted nothing to do with it. A little later on, maybe a year later, I was camping with a friend of mine and he, uh, he said, I got this new group and it was ACDC and uh, I was seven, I think seven time, and uh, he, we were staying in the camper and he started playing and it was, I think it was Highway to Hell is what it was. That scared me to death. I mean, I was, I can still feel the fear that I had at that time. Had trouble sleeping at night. And of course, I was a long way, good ways away from the house, and it was dark, and I didn't want to go home, you know, who's scared of that. Uh, but everything, you know, everything, you say, well, it's innocent. Look, if it's, if it's innocent, then why don't they portray themselves as innocent? Can I get amen on that? If you don't want to be considered a child molester, then why do you portray yourself as a child molester? If you don't want to be considered a murderer, then why do you portray yourself as a murderer? If you don't want to be considered as evil and identify with all of that, why portray yourself with all of that? And it's interesting that people who get away from God, they go to the same kind of music, the same kind of bottle, and the same kind of drug. Isn't that interesting? Very fascinating, isn't it? And so, um, anyway, but it's become commonplace. Uh, it's just, we're just accepting. And no doubt, no doubt, probably every family in this church has family members that, that in turn are, they're, they're living out those lifestyles. It's even come close within our families that we find people that are involved with that. I don't believe in God, and I believe in the devil, or whatever. And there's, there's no real theology behind that. They're just speaking whatever they want to speak in most cases. There's, there's no real belief system. It's just the idea that I'm not for God, so I'm for anything else. And uh, so, listen to this. Marcia Elaidad, she is the, um, or was, uh, she was involved with the Chicago's Divinity School, University of Chicago's Divinity School, and this is what was said. The figure of Satan probably, probably was developed under the influence of Iranian dual, dualism, meaning that there is no truth to it, that, that it is a folk, it's folklore, it's a fairy tale. It was just created out of cultural experience. Uh, George McRae, a biblical scholar from Harvard Divinity Schools, and these are, these are older quotes, uh, not current as of today. Uh, he said this, The Old Testament simply does not contain a personal devil who is a principle, the principle of evil or God's adversary. So he's the head of the Divinity School, or was at that time, the head of Divinity School of Harvard. And uh, he said there's really, the Bible doesn't say anything about the devil. There's no devil. Uh, Peter Williams, he's a professor of American religious history, at, uh, or was, at Miami University in Ohio, said this, The concept of the devil is a way of focusing anxiety about, uh, anxiety about a diffused threat. It sometimes can get get a hold of that. It's something you can get a hold of that explains everything. In other words, by giving a person the concept of a devil, you now have a magnet so that you can, uh, you know, attract everything bad in your life too. It's the devil. Thus, we say the devil made me do it. You know, the devil. This the devil gets blamed. Now, these are people who profess to be on our side. <laughs> you know, profess to be line up. You know, with with our colors. Uh, they're people. People that you know that would make you know one would think that they in turn understand salvation and they they in turn understand the whole concept behind the cross of Calvary and yet they're saying basically that there is no enemy 
there is no enemy at all. And all of this idea of there being an enemy is not even true. Listen, if there was no Satan, there would be no sin. Sin, in turn, came by way of the temptations of Satan. Now, we understand that Adam and Eve were tempted and they gave in to the sin, yes, and they brought it in by one man into this world. But the originator of sin was Satan, not God. It was Satan himself. He is the father of sin. And be no, if there be no Satan, then in turn, there would be uh, no sin, uh, sin at all. Charles Ryrie, which is a very good uh, theology book, probably one of the better ones, uh, uh, to read. He said in his theology book, if one accepts scriptures as revelation from God, then the reality of Satan cannot be denied. You can't deny the fact that Satan is real if, in turn, you believe the Bible is inspired and given to us by God. It teaches a real adversary by name of Satan. And so, uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of beliefs out there. The Bible doesn't say anything about it, but it does. There's seven Old Testament books that I can identify that speak about Satan and his works. And every writer in the New Testament somehow identifies Satan, his person, his works, his presence, or something of that sort. Uh, in the Old Testament, Genesis, 1 Chronicles, Job, Psalms, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, these books teach about Satan's existence. And of course, every book in the New Testament. Dr. Chafer, who also has written a systematic theology book, he said this, This mighty angel appears in the Bible with prominence, importance, and power, second only to the Godhead three. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He's identifying. Dr. Chafer said, Satan in turn appears as the most powerful being that has been, that is created. And his power is only second to that of God himself. Dr. Chafer goes on to say, if the text of Scripture is observed, it will be found that this, this greatest of foe is held before the Christian's contemplation next only to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Meaning that if it's really true that Satan is real, then in turn he has the second greatest of power. Then in turn in a Christian's life, it's important, now catch this, that a Christian's in his day-to-day -day activity that he is going to find that the second greatest, second greatest matter that he struggles with or that he's tempted unto or contemplates has something to do with Satan himself, the origin of Satan. In other words, if Satan is real, then it's going to be a major ongoing issue in your life that you're going to have to deal with because of the power that he possesses. So, we ask the question then, who do you believe that Satan is? Look, if you will, Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew 5. Matthew 4, I'm sorry, Matthew 4. All right, Matthew chapter 4, verse number 5. Are you there? Say, ma'am. Then the devil taketh him, <clears throat> then the devil taketh him up uh, into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. Then Jesus said unto what? Him. Now, that's a personal pronoun that's given to identify Satan. It said in him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up unto an exceedingly high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory, there, uh, glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Verse 10, Then saith Jesus unto what? Him. him. Again, it's a personal pronoun. Satan's not an it. He's a him. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then it continues on how Satan leads him. And so from this we, we can see that uh, Jesus himself identified, he gave the personal pronoun of him unto Satan. Now having said that, we see a few things about Satan in the scriptures, and I, I know it's a little clerical, but it's Sunday school, so just tolerate it. Amen. First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians, look there if you will. Uh, Second Corinthians. A few things we see as far as his qualities or his characteristics. Second Corinthians chapter eleven. All right. Verse number 
verse number 3. Are you there? Say amen. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now this verse says many things about Satan, but one of the things that we see it says about him is that he possesses intellect. He possesses intellect. He is a him, a person, a pronoun that's given unto him. And as a person, he has intellect. He has the ability to reason and, you know, to make decisions, etc., etc., uh, that comes with intellect. Revelation chapter number 12. Look there if you will. We're just identifying the characteristics of Satan. Look with me. Perhaps you want to... Revelation chapter 12, talking about his characteristics or his qualities. Revelation 12, are you there? Say amen. Notice here, he has intellect. Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 17, it says this, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the, the commandment of God and had the testimony of Jesus Christ. The dragon is who? Who is a dragon? Help me out. It's Satan. You notice here the scripture identifies that he has emotions. So he experiences the highs and the lows based upon actions and reactions to, to those actions. And they generate, there's emotions that come back from him. In this case, there was a, you know, because of this, uh, the scripture says here, the woman and the remnant. We know what that's referring to. He was wroth. And wrath is wrath. It's taking justice in your own hands. And so there's an emotion that was expressed with that. Look, if you will, in Luke chapter number 22, talking about characteristics of this hymn, characteristics of our enemy. Luke in chapter 22. All right. Luke 22, are you there? Okay. Hold on now. Don't fall off. Uh, Luke 22, verse number 31. That's what it says here. <clears throat> and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath, what's the next word? Desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. And this passage here is identifying another characteristic of Satan. It's reinforced in 2 Timothy 2, 26. And listen to this. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who has taken captive by him at his will. And so what we see in these two verses is that it identifies that Satan not only has an intellect, the ability to reason, the process, to make decisions, that he not only has intellect, that your actions can somehow generate an emotional response from him, or the actions of a nation, or the action of a church, or the actions of a church could generate emotions from him, because he has highs and lows uh, of those emotions. But thirdly, we see here that he has a will. He possesses a will. And in these two verses here, Satan uh, desired to sift Peter as with, that was his will. Not God's will, but that was the desire of Satan. His lust, his desire, what he longed for was that he could sift Peter like wheat. That he could bring destruction to his life. Uh, and likewise, it's mentioned here in Second uh, Second Timothy. Look on, if you will, in Isaiah chapter fourteen. Isaiah fourteen is an important passage when it refers to this idea of uh, Satanology. I guess is the right word to use uh, the teaching on Satan. Isaiah chapter fourteen. Isaiah chapter fourteen gives us a little bit of an insight of those early <laughs> events. Isaiah chapter fourteen. Are you there? Say Amen. Okay, verse number thirteen. It says this, uh, verse twelve. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? And that's of course his original name, his created name, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto heaven, into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most 
Most High. Satan, who is our him, he's a person, who is our enemy, our adversary, who is has second greatest of power. And as Dr. Schaefer said, if that is really true, then he's going to be your second greatest concern or contemplation, meaning that you're going to find it's ongoing and constant, that just as you deal with conviction and comfort, uh, receive comfort by God, you're likewise going to be dealing with the temptation and destruction by what Satan's forces, the second greatest power. Uh, but this Satan, him, he has intellect. He reasons. He makes decisions. He has emotions. Your actions generate emotions on his part. Thirdly, he has a will. There's something he desires for you. And then fourth, we see here that uh, Satan has self-expression. And here we see that demonstrated. Now this is actually going back to before creation, as we know it, as he is in heaven as an archangel. That there, here, in that given time, that Satan is expressing that this is what I want. I, I want this and I want that. I want to be this, I want to be that. It's his ability to express himself. Look, if you will, in Revelation chapter number 20. Just talk about the characteristics of Satan. Okay, Revelation chapter 20. And verse number 10. Are you there? Say amen. Okay, good. And that and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented night and day. Read it for me, please. Forever and ever. So we see here he has intellect, emotions, will, self-expression. But last I want you to see that he has perpetuity, meaning that he, he is a created being, but a created being that forever lives. He forever lives. Satan is not, he will not ever be non existent. He was created by God and he will continue to live forever and ever and ever and ever. Now the Bible establishes in his created status, created state that he was an angel. Uh, we would believe, according to Ezekiel chapter number 28, that not only was an angel but he was an anointed cherub as, as is expressed in Ezekiel chapter 28. We would believe that he in turn was a part of those three angels, uh, the, the cherub angels, uh, three specific that had positions or authority like generals would have over a military. Um, we also would understand according to Job chapter number 1 that Satan as an angel, Lucifer as an angel, he was given access into the presence of God. And that's, that is a little difficult for me to understand. And just being honest with you, when I read Job chapter number 1, I don't quite understand uh, why it is that Satan still has access as he, as he does into the presence of God. And as best as I have been able to study and understand... Um, that he has this access because of what he has it because of his original state, not of his present state. I think that's confirmed in Revelation chapter 12. Uh, he has, as an angelic being, it was a prerogative that he was allowed to go into the presence of God. And he still accesses that today for the purpose of you know, maintaining um, a spirit of condemnation and bringing about destruction for the Christian. Uh, the first and the next thing we see in Matthew chapter 4, which we read just a moment ago, is that not only is he anointed cherub, he was part of those three, we believe that God had distributed, you know, if you will, uh, 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 what's the word, uh, delegated responsibilities unto. Uh, but he also uh, not only have access, but number three, we see that he's not omnipresent. In Matthew chapter 4, verse number 5, amongst other passages, he left, you know, he, he was in a place with Jesus Christ and then he left. Now he's able to get places very fast. He can go from one place to the next very fast, but Satan doesn't have, he doesn't have omnipresence as God has. Satan does his work by way of all of his demons and the organization that he's established thereby. That's why you'll see in some places that demonic activity is stronger than it is in other places. And it has much to do with his, his, he, his ability or his presence, how he establishes his presence. But he goes from one place to the next. So he's not omnipresent. And it goes without saying that he's not omniscient all-powerful or all-knowing and he's not omnipotent all-powerful like God is 
And so that obviously goes without saying, because he's a created being. So we know we have an adversary, and we understand that our adversary, that he is, that he's capable, that, that he is a him, that he has emotions and will, that he has tremendous power, the second greatest unto the Godhead, and that he is able to move around very well, and that he, he is a, a perpetual being, that he lives, and he has this prerogative that he can go before God and accuse you. And these are things we understand about Satan. <clears throat> but <clears throat> the question begs, and I know we've spoken about this, and even recently, and I, <clears throat> and I speak about it again because it's such a concern to me. <clears throat> How does Satan fight me? Now, I want to say that uh, there's teaching out there that we should, um, you know, get thee behind me, Satan, you know, things like that. Now, listen, I don't want to talk to Satan. Can I get amen on that? I want nothing to do with it. As far as I'm concerned, I just want to live my life with my eyes focused upon God. And I, if Satan would not see me or not know who I am or not have, I would be happy. I don't want to talk to him. And I certainly don't want to be the guy that stands up and says, Satan, you do this and you do that. It just may be that God may just temporarily take away protection from me. And so I, I don't think that's scriptural or biblical, and I don't think it's smart. You know, for you, for a person to go around talking and commanding Satan to do things and so forth. We hide under the garments of Jesus Christ. Let Christ be the one. If Michael, the archangel, did not rebuke Satan, then I think God should probably take... He's a, he's, a being, he's a perfected being with power that I don't have. And I think I ought to think twice before I start rebuking Satan. And so I don't like that. And I think that's, again, going back to this erosion of proper thoughts about Satan in the church and in our culture that, that we don't see him as the enemy as he is. Satan is an adversary. He, in turn, seeks to devour your life. Now, uh, when I was studying this a few years back, I was hung up on that word devour. And I started watching uh, videos about lions when they would attack prey. And I would just watch them and just think about it. And it was interesting because uh, lions, when they attack their prey, they, they just rip them apart. And there are some animals that, that they, they will bite them. And it's almost, there's a grace in the way that they do it. They'll inject venom, you know, and there's a, what's the, what's the big lizard? The Komodo dragon is the Komodo dragon that actually bite him and then puts the gang, you know, the person ends up dying of gang, and they just follow him around for days until they finally die and then they eat him. But a lion doesn't do that. A lion will chase, chase, you know, down whatever prey it is, and it's very subtly how he, that he does that. That's fascinating. But when he gets a hold of him, he just breaks and tears and rips that, you know, that animal apart. And so here, <clears throat> though we know that Christ is also called the Lion of Judah, but Peter, when he wanted to describe for us about Satan, he wanted you to understand that he is as a lion in how that he devours his prey. That he, he in turn wants to completely destroy your life, to render it useless, to, to, to have such a, an effect upon your life that in turn you're, you're of no value. That's what he wants to do. And we witness that. We see it happen to people that he just tears them apart. Our unsaved people that play around with, you know, Ouija boards and Satan and watch those things and get involved in activities and, and the substance and so forth. And, and I'm no better than they are. But they in turn have found themselves in the crosshairs of an enemy who devours their life, tears their life apart. And so how does he how does he attack me? Whether it's discouragement, worldliness, division, deceptions, you know, how does Satan work in my life? What is his strategy? And I think Jesus was very revealing uh, in John chapter 8, 44, when he said that when he helped us understand that Satan not only was a murderer, but he called him a, uh, called him a liar. And you abode not in the truth. 
And uh, <clears throat> again, forgive me for being repetitious about it. It's just, um, it's just such an important matter. Lies should never be embraced by a Christian. And it can be subtle and simple and little things such as Santa Claus is real. I don't, I don't think there's a problem if you like Santa Claus. I don't think there's a problem with that. There's a problem with you in turn making Santa Claus out to be something that he's not. He's not Jesus Christ. He's not omniscient. He's not any of those things. If you want to have a little red man in a suit, by a, I'm not, I don't care about that. But in every way, in, in our life, we have to be careful that we in turn are not embracing lies, allowing lies in our life. We expose that which is lies and we walk and live in that which is truth. It's truth. Okay. Uh, we know in Genesis chapter 3, it's exactly what Satan did. He, in the process of tempting Eve, uh, Brother, Brother Edwin, you go ahead and or someone hit the bell. I'm, I'm wrapping it up. If you can hit the bell, Romar. Um, so he just told lies. And so the lies, it doesn't say it directly on the pages of God's Word, but in Genesis chapter 3, it was systematic. There was three different lies that Satan was emphasizing to Eve. God doesn't love you. God doesn't want the best for you. God really doesn't mean what He says. And those are the lies that Satan was telling unto Eve. Well, he didn't say those directly, but they were implied. And Eve, in turn, took of the fruit, and she saw that it was good for food, and pleasant to the eyes, and desired to make one wise, and she, she took the fruit thereof, and she ate of it. And this is, the, this is how our enemy, how he fights us, is by way of lies. He implies half-truths to us. He leads us into believing something is. And it could be, you know, it could be, a, you know, about direct commandments of God. It could be about who we are as a person. You know, it, this idea of... 127 genders that were, you know, that's become public today. That's how Satan works. He lies to people. Or they're confused about who they even are. Well, there's, that's not complicated. You either male or female, and our culture has understood this for many years, and it's only been in these last years there's great confusion about that. It's the evidence of spiritual activity or of our adversary that it's at work, that we in turn have given, given way to that. There's a lot of behavioral things that even get hid under lies. You know? There's a lot of, you know, a lot of present actions, things, decisions that you've made that you have hid under lies about a past, about something you went through in the past, as far as, me, I was a victim. These are lies and ways in which Satan, he tells lies to you. Romans chapter 1, Philippians chapter 4, these are verses again that emphasize this. And so what does Philipp or 1 Peter chapter 5 tell us? It says we should be sober, as serious-minded. That we in turn are not, we're not intoxicated, you know, in any way with anything. We're not intoxicated, you know, with, with money or intoxicated with grief or intoxicated with, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, with fame or intoxicated with possessions or toys or activities. We're sober-minded. We, we live in reality. We walk in reality. We see things as they are. We don't stand on the arm of our couch and we jump off and act like we're Superman. You know, we're going to fly around the living room because we can't and we don't. We don't. We don't walk around and pretend that we are somebody that we're not. We don't pretend. We don't play. There's a sober-mindedness about we see ourselves for who we are. We see life for what it is. And we, as best we can, try to maintain a sober mindset in all things. Problems come, and we don't sweep them underneath the rug. We're sober-minded about them. We have a, this a reality. It's, this is what it is. And then he says, be vigilant. Meaning, referring to being watchful. We're always looking. 
Now we think we're uh, Satan's not going to make his way in our church. And I would think that it's going to be harder for him to make his way in our church because of the presence of believers and the songs and the, the testimonies and the prayers and so forth and so on. But he can find his way in churches. And he's ripped a lot of churches apart. And so not myself, not just the deacons, trustees, but all of us as a church family, we walk diligently. We're looking, we're diligent to look and see open doors where Satan would try to make his way, not only in our families, but make his way into our lives, but make his way into our church. So we're very careful about that. And uh, there's many, 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 many open doors in how he chooses to do that. And so here in the church, we always want to maintain a spirit and attitude of just that, a spirit and attitude of vigilance, of diligence. I go back to comments that I've made periodically about you know, these church movement in America today. The, my, there's many things that I struggle with it, but one of, the, one of the greatest struggles that I have with it is essentially people who want to be vigilant, people who want to be diligent about their faith in Jesus Christ and about their enemy is being deemed, they're being labeled, they're being, you know, you know they're being uh, identified as people that are eccentric or erratic, or not erratic, but uh, eccentric or fanatical or, you know, they're contentious or whatever be the case. Well, I'd listen, I just don't think I'm going to make it as a faithful man unto God my whole life by accident. And I don't think this church is going to be productive and fruitful for Jesus Christ by accident. I think it's more likely that this church will not be fruitful and will fail and Satan will get control of it if, in turn, there's not a spirit of diligence in the church and vigilance in the church. You say, I, of course, I think history bears record of that. Um, I must emphasize this and just and close here that uh, though we understand that Satan has an intellect and a will and that he has tremendous power, that he's the ability to self-express himself, that he maybe not is not omnipresent, but he can travel, that he, you know, uh, has access to God. And, you know, and we see all of this about him as a person, who he is. And he has all this power and he has just a history book of destruction he's brought upon nations and individuals. The scripture never tells me nor leads me to be fearful of Satan. I don't fear Satan. I fear God. Satan, in turn, can't touch me unless God allows him to touch me or if I jump out of the fence of my protection. Because I today live, I live in a, I live inside of a fenced area of God's presence and His protection. And Satan, in turn, can't touch me. And I'm not bragging, and nor am I pointing my finger and, you know, it's Satan about that. I'm just merely stating a fact. But if I jump out of the fence of God's protection in rebellion, that's what the Scripture means in 1 Corinthians 5 about giving someone over for the destruction of flesh. That's Satan. God is allowing Satan to fulfill his chastisement, just as he allowed Nebuchadnezzar. It's the same. Conceptually, it's exactly the same. God allowed the enemy of Israel to bring destruction upon Israel, but God used it for his benefit. And many Christians jump out of the fence of God's protection, and God allows the enemy to take advantage and to sift them as wheat. And it's for his, it, God uses it in his economy for his benefit or your benefit. But Satan is not going to touch you and bring destruction to your life unless you in turn decide to jump out of the fence as protection. And so uh, we rejoice in that. We rejoice in that. So we keep our mind pure and clean. We, we make sure there's no, there's no uh, lies that we're harboring. Philosophically, educational, you know, media, you know, Hollywood, all that kind of stuff. It's lies like a marriage is 50-50. Marriage is not 50-50. And I've been joking with Jared about that this week. Tell him to tell his girlfriend about that. Says marriage is fifty-fifty. You know, I'm paying for fifty percent of the honeymoon. You're paying for the other fifty percent of the honeymoon. <laughs> Uh, marriage is not 50-50. Marriage is 100%, 100%. And, 
and more specifically, my part in marriage is to worry about Marty and to make sure that Marty's doing his 100%. Not to worry so much about Joe doing her 100%, but me. Those are lies. There's a lie that's been a lot told about, you know, about this idea of, of the structure side of a home. Feminism has done a terrible work inside of people's lives. And where women, they've, they're led to believe that it's, it's humiliating for them to be a homemaker and to have children and to, to raise their children for God. In God's economy and the scriptures, you know, motherhood and wifery, I guess is the right word, wifery, is in turn is the most honorable positions that a woman could take. Those are lies. Well, I don't, I don't care if the world is impressed with how my wife and I have structured our lives. It doesn't matter. But I will, I do understand that those things, you, you can find yourself being tempted and, you know, by all of that. And, uh, but lies. Lies that have been told that spanking your child, that it, it's abuse. Now, my children probably would agree with that. That's a lie. That is a lie. You know, you're, you're God specifically. You know, as the one man said, never smack a child in the face because God has prepared a better place. Amen. God prepared, God made that body of a child in such a way so that, so that a parent could lovingly discipline the child to help bring corrective measures in their life. And, um, you know, if a parent doesn't access and use, follow God's plan, then that child, the Bible says, that's how you deliver a child from hell. You know, that, that's how you help that child deliver that child from himself. Very important. A lot of lies told about that. Lies told about money. Lies told about your life. You know, live for number one. You know, the Hallmark philosophy. You know, do what's in your heart. Well, what's in my heart is to kill people and to steal and to cheat and to lie. Not literally. I'm not one to kill anybody today. <gasps> the preacher said he wanted to kill people. Anyway, you understand. That's what's in our heart. And so, it lies. And uh, when I hear something like that, and I make fun of it. I, I've, I correct it because I do not want to have lies in my mind. I want to believe what is true, what is right. And that's what David said in Psalms 51. Thou desirest truth on the inward parts. God wants you to embrace, certainly is referring to His words, but truth is truth. It's raining, it's snow, you know, the person was bad, that's truth. Truth is truth. Truth isn't just truth because it's God's Word. Truth is truth because it's true. And that was David's whole fault, as David in turn wasn't acknowledging truth. He was living, he was living in such a way to try to make God out to a lie. And the last time I spoke on this a few weeks ago was out of 1 John chapter 5. And that's where I ended. You, you lie to yourself, or you lie to others, you lie to yourself, and then you try to make God a liar. You live it. And that's what David did. He lied, and he lied, and then he tried to live out that lie, making God a liar. And God disciplined him, and God dealt with him. And so we don't want to live in lies. All right, let's get out of here. Let's go eat dinner, okay? And we're looking forward to seeing what you're eating at the back door, so I'm going to ask you. Stand with me, please, and let's uh, have a we'll closing word of prayer and ask God's blessings. Brother Steve, if you'll dismiss us, please. <laughs> Sermon lessons for our lives. We'll be asking you to be with us as we go home.